adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. In biblical times, being sick was often viewed as divine justice. If you suffered from blindness, skin disease, or maybe a bum knee, chances were that you brought it on yourself. Falling ill was no picnic. Not only did the ancients lack basic medical care, but sometimes those with a mark of sickness were banished. And of all the illnesses you could get, nothing was worse than leprosy. According to the Gospels, the only cure for this terrible disease was the hand of Jesus. But many scholars now believe that due to a mistranslation of the Hebrew Bible, Jesus might not have been curing leprosy after all. A stunning new archaeological find may actually hold the answer. With archaeology as my guide, I'm going to take a closer look at ancient medicine and get to the bottom of this leprosy mystery. But first, I want to find out where the ancients went to soothe what ailed them. The Bible says water was a great healer. It outlines the benefits of washing and bathing, and both Jews and Christians used water to purify body and soul. And I've just heard that archaeologists have uncovered a giant ancient pool near Siloam in Jerusalem. Could this be the famous pool mentioned in the Christian Bible where Jesus healed the blind man? A man called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes, and said, Go to the pool of Siloam, and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. I'm going to meet up with archaeologist Gabi Barkai to find out if this is the same pool. We are now in the ancient pool of Siloam, which was discovered just uh, in the last month. So is, is this one of those magic moments where the Bible and archaeology meet? This is the very pool which is mentioned. There is no other alternative. The dating of the pool is secure. It is uh, first century. You can imagine Jesus standing here curing people. This is the very pool. And the pool so, is where? Right so here. the pool is this large orchard here with the uh, pomegranate trees. Next to the uh, pool here, we see the remains of the steppe edges, uh, which is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, as the place where Jesus uh, cured the uh, blind man. And people gathered here in order to find remedy for their uh, troubles. So this must be one of the most important biblical archaeological finds ever, actually connecting Bible with archaeology. Yes. Pretty amazing. So, according to the Gospel of John, it was here at the Pool of Siloam that Jesus cured the blind man and the discovery of the pool gives new life to the story. But what about the stories of Jesus healing lepers? Has anything been found that corroborates these tales? Scholars are skeptical. They point to a mistranslation of the Hebrew Bible where the term tsarat was incorrectly replaced with leprosy. Today, Hansen's disease is the correct name for the ailment that causes body parts to fall off. According to scholars, Hansen's disease didn't exist during Jesus' time. So whatever he was curing, it wasn't leprosy. What was it? Professor John Kloppenberg, first century expert, explains. Tsara and lepra, or lepros uh, in Greek, probably refers to the same physical ailment, which is a kind of psoriasis, perhaps, or a skin blemish. Not really leprosy. In the Hebrew Bible, it's not Hansen's disease. And probably in the New Testament, it's not Hansen's disease either. The problem is that when you use a word like lepros, and then subsequently lepros gets identified with Hansen's disease, it becomes, it becomes a uh, sort of an automatic equation that 
that Jesus is, is curing people from leprosy, but... You're telling me he just cured people of the heartache of uh, psoriasis? psoriasis. <laughs> That's what we're talking about? Well, we might trivialize this, but if you, if you read the injunctions in Leviticus about what one has to do as a leper, you are separated from your social unit, from your family. So the heartache of psoriasis was not so much the, the actual itching, was the, 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 it was a sign of impurity. It's a sign of impurity which, separate, which, which causes you to be separate from the rest of society. So according to Professor Kloppenberg, there was no real leprosy at the time of the Old Testament in the Holy Land. But I'm not convinced that it hadn't arrived by Jesus' time. Before I investigate this, I need to understand disease and biblical times. And it's clear from the Bible that quarantine was often used to isolate sick people, not just lepers. Does this mean that all sick or disabled people were left out in the cold? There's a forensic pathologist in Tel Aviv who's found some ancient bones that tell a very different story. In ancient times, leprosy was the most feared of all diseases. Not just because it was incurable, but because the Bible decreed that lepers must be cast out from their homes. A leper's lot in life was one of solitary suffering. So, does this mean that all sick people were shunned by society? Dr. Baruch Arensberg says no. He's been collecting ancient bones for years. He can read a bone like a book. And the bones in this box have a surprising story to tell. They reveal that the ancients were not heartless, but compassionate. We have here from the Roman period, Oh, and you can see these are uh, bones that were found not far from uh, Jerusalem. And you can see that inside, inside of the vertebra, it is divided by a wall. How old was she when she died? She was around 25, 30 years old when she died. That's significant. In ancient times, people lived shorter lives. Disabled people's lives were shorter still. Finding ancient bones that show severe disability and a relatively long life can only mean one thing. So this, somebody looking at this sees a pile of bones. You look at this and you say, this shows me that the community took care of its disabled. Uh, absolutely, this is the best case and the importance is not only on the pathology, but on the environment, on wow. the social conditions they were living. The, wow. So that means survived. people people cared for each other. Yeah. Aaronsburg's collection shows us that in biblical times, compassion was the first step in any treatment. But compassion alone doesn't mend broken bones. So who did the ancients go to for more sophisticated care? I'm meeting Ofra Rimon, curator of the Hecht Museum in Haifa. She's gathered an astonishing array of medical paraphernalia from the first century that helps us understand what kind of treatment was available to ancients who fell ill. Okay, here we see medical instruments. Wow, how old are these? 2,000 years ago. No way. There was a custom to bury the physician along with all the instruments that he used in his life. You mean like if he screwed up and didn't save the patients, they buried him with his uh, no, tools? No, no. Right? Okay, Simcha, let's focus on what we have here in this vitrine. You can see that the instruments are very delicate, very small in size. For instance, the scalpel. Scalpel. And what you have here is just the handle. There was a blade here. Yes, it was made of iron, but iron oxidized, and that's why it was not preserved. Did they use it for operations? Yes. Another medical instrument is the probe. Where and did, it was where used... Where did they probe? <laughs> they were used for examining cavities in the body. I can imagine 2,000 years ago, patients going, not the probe, doctor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anything but the probe. Okay. Examining these ancient surgical instruments shows me just how sophisticated first-century medicine was. But what about pain? Opium. Opium, yes. 
Uh, this vessel is 3,000, more than 3,000 years old, and uh, it was produced in Cyprus. You can see the similarity between it and between the shape of the poppy seed. It's so much alike. Even the color, eh? Even the color, exactly. Now, were they doing that for entertainment reason or for medical reason? It was mainly for medical reason. You can use the opium while you have pains and also by drinking. You know, they uh, oper they operate people. Oh, and it's like an uh, anesthetic. <clears throat> yes. So this is a 3,300-year-old 3, anesthetic, in a sense, or uh, uh, at least a medicine. Uh, yes, exactly. Were lepers using imported opium? I don't think so. I wonder what other medicines were available. Today, there's a lot of attention paid to the healing powers of plants and herbs. But what about the ancients? Dr. Sarah Salon, founder of the Natural Medicine Unit of the Hadassah Hospital in Jerusalem, has been studying how the ancients used these early medicines. So tell me about herbs in the Bible. There are many, many, many plants that are mentioned in the Bible. The prophet Ezekiel says, the fruit shall be for food the leaf for medicine. So he saw f fruit as food, but he saw the primar primary function of herbs as medicine. Yes, of course. Ezekiel, I mean, Ezekiel. that's a heavyweight. They're all heavyweights. <laughs> there are no lightweights. <laughs> <laughs> in the Bible. No, no, no. But the local people in this region for thousands of years have used these medicinal plants as folk medicines. Is there any kind of detective work involved? Did you look in the Bible, find out some herb, ate it and cured? Leprosy with I it just want to say that there are many roots to the same truth. We took many of these medicinal plants and we grew our own medicinal plants based on the wild seeds. So you grew biblical plants? Yes, we grew biblical plants. And then we harvested them and then we began to test them. And what did we find so far? Well, we found that they were right. They really do have a very powerful antibacterial activity. Do they make a good salad? Some of them do and some of them taste really awful. <laughs> really horrible. Really bad. We're also looking at them for their effect on the immune system. And we find that some of those herbs mentioned in the Bible, like the Artemisia, do have a significant effect on the immune system, a positive boosting effect on the immune system. In terms of the, the uh, Gospels, Jesus' time, yeah. is there anything mentioned there? Myrrh, mentioned in the Bible by the three kings bringing gifts of myrrh. Why myrrh? Because of its use in anointing, but also as a medicine. It was more valuable than gold. You have to understand that in the Bible itself, there are very few references to actual disease and a plant. One of the few references is when Hezekiah has boils all over him and the prophet Nahum gives him figs to eat to cure the boils. Now people are looking at figs and they find that they are anti-infective and they're also anti-cancer, apparently. Coincidence? I think not. There are no such things as coincidence, <laughs> especially when we're talking about the Bible. Dr. Salone's research proves the Bible's health tips really do work. But I've heard that another plant was used in ancient times. A plant that's illegal today, but one we've all heard of, and maybe even tried. Cannabis. Were the ancients just toking up to relieve the pain? I feel very good. Can somebody help me stand up, please? Herbal medicines were used in ancient Egypt as far back as 10,000 BC. Over the centuries, much of this knowledge made its way around the ancient world. The Bible recognizes the therapeutic properties of strong wine and a few herbal concoctions, and that's about it. But some are suggesting that by Jesus' time, the ancients were getting high for medical purposes. Professor Raphael Mechulam, expert of pharmacology at Hebrew University. He's figured out what the ancients would have reached for when they were in pain. Well, my lab is a chemical lab. We work in chemistry and pharmacology, mostly in medicinal plants, in particular cannabis, marijuana, hashish. Oh, you're an last expert on marijuana. Well, I've worked on that for many years. We identified the active compound in marijuana, THC. Now, wasn't some uh, cannabis found in a tomb yeah. here in Israel? They found a Roman tomb near Beth Shemesh, 20 kilometers south of Jerusalem. They found a young girl there that had died at the age of 
14 maybe, she was pregnant, too small to give birth, and therefore she was obviously in fantastic pain. And they found some ashes next to the remains. So they gave us the ashes to analyze, and we found traces of cannabis. It shows that at that time they were using cannabis. Oh, they used it for pain, they used it for uh, uh, <coughs> apparently what we would call antibiotic, they use it for some stomach problems. They knew uh, quite a lot about cannabis, and they used it. As I walk the streets of Jerusalem, I think about how easy we have it. Doctors and hospitals, easy access to medicine. The ancients didn't have it so good. The best these pharmacologically challenged people could hope for was a few puffs on a marijuana pipe. I'm not about to try cannabis myself, but I will try the next best thing a traditional Middle Eastern treat, the hookah. It might just be what the doctor ordered. I'm gonna have my first nargila experience. The nargile, a Turkish water pipe. The tobacco is placed in the metal top and kept burning by a small piece of charcoal. The smoke is cooled by being drawn through the water in the bowl. This is a first for me, and they assure me this is tobacco. Take my little piece of coal and stick it on top. All over the Middle East, to this very day, people understand about medicine and the therapeutic use of smoke and tobacco. The smoke may not be good for you, but just relaxing and not doing any chores, that's good for you. Just the general attitude that you're getting away with it is very therapeutic. Very nice, very nice. <coughs> <coughs> I think my coal is not hot enough. I have a de deficient coal. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can get used to this. This is just sit around. Just sit here and relax, right? Relax. Let the wife take care of things, huh? Crazy. But I've been thinking all these years. <laughs> I am getting a little lightheaded. Actually, I'm getting quite lightheaded. I feel very good. Can somebody help me stand up, please? Can somebody help me stand up? Time for me to take a walk and clear my head. The effect of the smoke was a little more than I anticipated. The hookah may not actually cure anything, but it definitely has some kind of anesthetic property. I feel pretty good. But what if you had leprosy? The Gospels tell us Jesus healed it. But that was a miracle. And many scholars reject the notion that Jesus healed leprosy at all. Some go so far as to say that leprosy didn't even exist at the time of Jesus. But now, archaeology has proven them wrong. We're going with archaeologist Shimon Gibson to an ancient cave where he made the discovery of a lifetime. He's found the world's oldest leper. The Gospels give four examples of Jesus healing leprosy. But was it really leprosy? Many scholars say no. They claim leprosy didn't exist in Jesus' time. This brings me to the Hinnom Valley, where a Jewish burial ground has stood for almost 3,000 years. It's here that Professor Shimon Gibson has single-handedly solved the leprosy mystery. What's the significance of this tomb? Well, here we have the oldest evidence of uh, leprosy in existence. Anywhere? Relating to Hansen's disease, where you have a nose falling off and disfigurement and, and, and so forth. Do we have any example of leprosy anywhere in the world earlier than this? Not as far as I'm aware, no. Let's go in. There are going to be possible spiders, rabid dogs, sharp stones. You're not joking. Possible no, I'm not joking. Possibility. And you're lucky you've got big boots on. We're what about tomb fever? There's such a thing? No, it's called K fever. Yeah. I actually was ill with it. They're little bugs. What they do is they infect your bloodstream and then uh, you'll go crazy. Well, you're already crazy. So. Nobody will notice, right? <laughs> okay, let's, let's go ahead now. 
Watch out for the spiders. Sound man's not coming in. Lone light man. Doesn't stop the naked archaeologist. Oh my goodness. I found an ancient battery. Mm, good. How do we do this? Well, you've got to take that. Okay. And then I'm going to go down. See you back, yeah? So this is the first tomb chamber as soon as you come into the cave. Um, and in the walls you have these loculi in which the bodies were placed. The tomb robbers decided to check on one of these loculi, which turned out to be access to a lower chamber. Now this is a very deep shaft here. There are all these slugs on the wall. Yeah, come on down. Whoa, I hate that slug. Some people eat slugs. You know? They eat slugs? Yeah. You got How do you get through this without touching the walls? You just slide forward. Okay, this is very, all very intimate. Uh, I just yeah. want to make sure there's no dog or something. What the hell is that cocoon thing? Then uh, just remember, we gotta, we gotta get out of here. Afterwards. Don't get nervous. You're with me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see all the bones here? Look. Oh, Do you see here? This is one of these uh, burial niches in which the bones were placed after the body had decomposed. You can see this. This is part of a leg bone. There's even part of a jaw here. These are the stone slabs which covered the entrances to the loculi, and they've all been whipped off. This first century crypt once contained dozens of ossuaries, or stone burial boxes, all of which have either been destroyed or stolen. Jewish burial practices at the time specified that the bodies of the recently deceased had to be set out in niches. And then, after the bodies decomposed, the bones would be gathered up and placed in ossuaries. Only one loculi was overlooked, sealed shut with a deadly secret. You see the cement here, there's a very hard cement. They cemented it up. Now there's apparently a reason for that. I think they feared disease. If they feared that the person was sick from something contagious, they wouldn't take the bones and put them in an ossuary. They'd just seal them right there. Until tomb robbers came into the cave and they ripped open the door. What they saw was just some brown muck. And it's a, it's a very important find. Hidden by that muck were human remains. Samples of these bones were sent to Thunder Bay, Canada, home to one of the world's leading forensic pathology labs. After years of analysis, scientists uncovered something new to the world of archaeology. From the medical results, we know that he suffered from Hansen's disease. It was quite advanced um, uh, leprosy, apparently. Evidence of the oldest leprosy in the world. Yeah. Let's get out of here. OK. We may never know if Jesus actually healed leprosy. But with these dates confirmed, Gibson's discovery proves that leprosy did exist during Jesus' time, most likely introduced to the Holy Land by Roman soldiers returning from India. With the cure being almost 2,000 years away, ancient lepers had little hope, yet they still had a surprisingly complex range of options. For the most part, the ancients relied on what we would call alternative therapies, primarily herbal medicines, many of which hold the same properties as modern drugs. And if they didn't come across Jesus, there was always the hookah to ease the pain. And the Bible itself offers some very healthy advice about hygiene, diet, and quarantine, with archaeology providing a sound second opinion. I know this is stupid, but I didn't know strong tobacco could make you high. <laughs> <laughs>